I want to talk about uh, how experience alters brain circuits during critical periods of development. And uh, in particular, I want to use the visual system as an example. And this is, we've really been working on this for my entire career in my lab. My mom actually, she, you know, she would say, well, what are you doing now in the lab? And I would tell her, well, we're working on how the brain changes with experiences during critical periods of development. And she would say, you're still working on the same problem. <laughs> yes, mom. So anyhow, and so, uh, Today, I, I want to use the visual system as an example to try to understand some of the underlying cell and molecular mechanisms for how, it, how using your brain alters circuits. And the, the specific circuits I want to discuss today, there are actually two circuits that I want to talk about. Um, and they're really in the early visual system. The first are the sets of connections coming from the retina to the first target structure in the brain uh, called the lateral geniculate nucleus, the LGN. And I also want to talk about the connections from the LGN neurons to the neurons in the primary visual cortex. And the point you see here is what I want to make, which is that these connections are not just random. They're highly organized connections. And one aspect of organization is that the inputs from the two eyes are strictly segregated from each other both at the level of the lateral geniculate nucleus and also at the level of primary visual cortex. So in the LGN, for instance, you can see that uh, the output neurons from the retina, the retinal ganglion cells, the retinal ganglion cells send their connections to end in layers uh, that are specific for the eye of origin. So left eye ganglion cells send their connections to left eye layers where the LGN neurons then receive input only from the left eye. Right eye ganglion cells so that send their connections to right eye layers. And actually, there are more than just two layers. But the point I want to make is that the inputs in the adult are segregated from each other according to these eye-specific layers, or fundamentally according to eye input. And then at the level of primary visual cortex, again, the LGN neurons don't just send their connections randomly, but in fact, again, especially in higher mammals like us and in cats and monkeys that have highly binocular vision, these connections also are segregated. Uh, in fact, here, you know, like right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye. But instead of into layers, they're kind of interdigitated with each other. So the question is really, how is this segregation achieved during development? And I think when Hubel and Weasel first discovered these amazing patterns of connectivity, especially this segregation in visual cortex, which forms the uh, anatomical basis for their famous ocular dominance columns. I'll come back to this later. Everybody thought, oh my god, this is crystalline. This has to be hardwired during development. But in fact, now we know that these patterns of connectivity emerge from a less precise uh, set of inputs initially during development. And a nice example of that that I want to talk about for a while now is connections between retina and LGN and the formation of these eye-specific layers. Now, this story actually starts much earlier in development. So it, and I'll just sort of fast forward for a minute and say that actually the eye-specific layers develop in utero. And for example, in humans, in us, they're formed by the end of the first trimester of development. So a lot of development is happening in utero. And yet, what I'm going to tell you is that these patterns of connections actually require signaling and neural activity and the signaling between the eye and the brain. But obviously, it cannot be vision, because at that time, it's too early in development. So keep that in mind. And so the first point I want to make is that the adult pattern of eye-specific layers is not present initially in development. In fact, the inputs from the two eyes initially are intermixed with each other. And then the mature pattern forms subsequently by a process of remodeling of synapses. So let me just explain what I mean by that. So you'll notice that in the adult, an LGN neuron sitting here in this green layer gets its input only from ganglion cells that originate in the, in the right eye. And an LGN neuron here sitting in this layer gets its input from ganglion cells situated in the left eye. But in development, individual LGN neurons receive input from both eyes, from ganglion cells in both eyes. And many studies have shown that, if you, that this input is functional. So these synapses are present early in development. 
And if you stimulate the right optic nerve or the left optic nerve, then the LGN neuron receives functional synaptic input. So to get to the mature pattern of connections, a process of synapse remodeling is happening during development. And what that involves is both the elimination of inputs, inappropriate inputs, let's say here, from the left eye, as well as the strengthening and stabilization of appropriate inputs coming from the right eye. So the development of the mature pattern involves both synapse elimination and, so weakening and elimination and strengthening and stabilization to get to the adult pattern. Now we also know that this remodeling process requires neural activity. And these were experiments that were done many years ago by many, many members of my lab. And I'm happy to say actually that all of these uh, wonderful postdocs and students who contributed to these experiments all now have their own labs. They've grown up and actually, let's see, almost all of them, not quite, have tenure, so that's good. Phew. Anyhow. So we, we discovered this by blocking neural activity during the period when this remodeling happens. And when we blocked activity, we discovered, actually, that there's a persistence of the immature pattern of connectivity. So there's a failure to remodel connections. And, if it, and the, the eye-specific layers actually don't emerge during development. Now, when we first did these experiments, you know, I, I said, well, where is this activity coming from? Because in all species, either this remodeling is happening in utero, but also even in mice or in ferrets that are already born, this remodeling process happens after birth, but it happens before the rods and the cones are functional. So it actually happens before the vertical transmission from the photoreceptors through the interneurons to the ganglion cells is actually present and before vision is possible. So where is this activity coming from that we blocked during this early time in development to prevent the formation of the eye-specific layers? And again, to make a really long story short, many people have worked on this in my lab and also in other labs, including labs here at UC Davis. Um, what we discovered is that early in development, the eye is actually sort of auto-dialing. It's spontaneously active. The ganglion cells are sitting in the retina, and they're actually firing action potentials, which are being transmitted to the LGN, which in fact we know are even causing the LGN neurons to fire action potential. So there's early spontaneous activity present in the developing system. And what's even more amazing is this activity is not just sort of some random activity like, you know, um, uh, little tiny points of light twinkling of the stars. In fact, it's highly correlated activity so that neighboring ganglion cells fire together and through a process about which we actually know something more now, but I don't have time to talk about it. Cells that fire together wire together and out of sync lose your link. So there's heavy and synaptic mechanisms that cause the strengthening and weakening in response to these patterns of activity that are highly correlated in the retina. And we discovered this using a variety of different methods, but I just want to give you a feeling for these patterns of correlated activity, which are rather like um, local waves of activity in which neighborhoods of ganglion cells become depolarized, fire action potentials together, and that information is then being relayed to the LGM. So if you take the retinas out and put them in a dish, when ganglion cells are active and fire action potentials, they undergo increases in intracellular calcium as calcium comes in through voltage-sensitive calcium channels. So if you load the retinas with calcium-sensitive dyes, like Fura and so on, then you can actually monitor the patterns of activity in the retinas over time, as uh, Marla Feller and Rachel Wong did when they were in my lab. And that's how they discovered these waves of activity. And so this is then a, a, a movie of waves. It's speeded up a bit, because these waves are actually slow, and they happen every, once every one or two minutes. And at this scale, uh, this is about the whole retina during early development. And uh, a ganglion cell is about the size of one or two pixels. And when the ganglion cells fire action potentials and undergo increases in calcium, they, they turn black in this image. So you can see that actually 
these waves recruit simultaneously hundreds of ganglion cells, which are firing together in this sort of pattern. And these waves are constantly changing. So eventually, every neighbor in the, in the retina becomes spo correlated um, spontaneously with other neighbors in the retina. And it's this pattern of activity, then, that's being sent to the LGN. And remember, you can shine light on these retinas until you're blue in the face. And there's no, you can't make the ganglion cells fire. This is spontaneously generated activity. And it's present during the entire period when these eye-specific layers form, and a little bit after, actually. And then when vision takes over, the waves actually disappear. And vision then provides the activity and provides local correlations, which continue this activity-dependent process, not only in the LGN, but then also at later times in the connections from LGN to primary visual cortex. So early on, it's a spontaneous activity. So let me just summarize what I've said so far. So what I've said so far is that the adult pattern of connectivity is not present initially. It has to emerge through a process of synapse remodeling that involves both strengthening and weakening, remember that, and that this process requires neural activity, in this case in the form of spontaneous activity that's highly correlated. So a number of years ago, we asked the question, well, how is it that activity is ultimately translated into lasting changes in structure, in connectivity. And we wondered, could we understand something about the molecular mechanisms of this translation process? In other words, could, could it be that neural activity drives the expression of sets of genes that are required for this remodeling process? And that wasn't you know, such a crazy idea, because we know, for example, that changes in gene expression are required for learning and memory. You know, Famous Krebs, for example, changes are required, uh, both in Drosophila and also in mammals, for uh, encoding uh, experience into lasting memory. And so we wondered, could we find such genes that were involved in this very early process of synapse remodeling? So we did a very simple experiment, technically not simple, but conceptually simple. So we, we, we compared gene expression under normal conditions versus activity block conditions. And just for aficionados, we blocked activity by infusing to trototoxin, which blocks voltage-sensitive um, sodium channels, so blocks uh, action potential activity. And uh, in, in the experiments, actually, we uh, dissected out, we blocked activity and we dissected out the LGNs and extracted RNA from the target neurons, the LGN neurons. But actually, we infused tetrodotoxin, so it actually went all over the place. And we compared gene expression in um, regular activity present versus activity absent um, LGNs that had grown up during this very period when the eye specific layers are forming. And this is, and we actually found a number of really interesting candidate genes. So first we conducted a secondary screen and we, one of these candidates was quite cool to us because it's present in the normal brain that has activity, but is downregulated in activity blocked. And then actually we figured out what this gene was and we made a riboprobe and we wanted to check that it really was expressed in the LGN. It better be there because that was our starting material. So when we did that experiment, and these experiments were all done by Rod Corvo and, jo and Gene Ho when they were in the lab, and you see that this gene is very nicely expressed, the mRNA, uh, under normal circumstances, but very much down-regulated in this activity block condition. So as I said, we, we actually uh, sequenced and we, we knew this, what this gene's identity was, and here's where we got a huge surprise, a shock, actually, because this particular candidate that I just showed you is <laughs> identical <laughs> to uh, a known MHC class one uh, transcript, actually. So this is weird, right? Because, I mean, we started in the brain and we found ourselves in the immune system. And if we had known any better, we would have left this immediately, but we were very naive because we thought as neuroscientists, we, th we were thanking our lucky stars that the nervous system was complicated enough and thank God we didn't have to know anything about the immune system. And so luckily what we didn't know is that we stumbled right into a dogma, which is that the brain was thought to be immune privileged. It is immune privileged 
But one aspect of this immune privilege was thought to be that neurons, the healthy brain, does not express MHC class I uh, molecules, either protein or transcripts. Now, it was well known at the time that MHC class I protein is upregulated and can be detected in neurons following damage to the brain, um, you know, uh, inflammatory cytokine treatment of neurons and culture and so on. But it was thought that these, that this was only in the pathological condition. There was no role for MHC class one normally in the brain. So this was the dogma. We didn't know the dogma. So first of all, we had to find out what the heck is MHC class one. So I just want to remind you, just in case, I'm sure you all know this, but it turns out this is a very large gene family. And uh, the, the, these are transmembrane molecules that require a light chain called beta-2 microglobulin. Uh, all of them, almost, require this light chain to be stably expressed on the cell surface. In the, um, uh, they also, these molecules are loaded with peptides uh, uh, in the proteasome. And normally, if these peptides are self, are, are from healthy cells, whether it's in the immune system, in the body in general, or in neurons, uh, this peptide is presented to circulating T cells, and it's recognized by the T cell receptor. And if it's self, then the lymphocytes are not activated to do anything. But if uh, the cells are infected, let's say with a virus, then MHC class I proteins are loaded with foreign peptide. And this presence of the foreign peptide activates T cell receptors, I mean T cells, by rec via recognition with T cell receptors, activates a program that actually leads to the destruction and death of the infected cell. And this is the adaptive immune system. And this is the system that's also required for tissue transplantation, appropriate HLA for matching of tissue. And in a way, this is a system that makes me different from you. This is our, this is our HLA you know, complement. So, what I want to tell you about today is that we believe that not only are these HLA MHC class one proteins present in the brain in healthy neurons, but we believe there are also neuronal receptors, not T cell receptor, but actually receptors that belong to the innate immune system that are also expressed in neurons. And I'm going to tell you about one today, but I think it's the tip of the iceberg. And that this forms a signaling system that we think is required for synapse remo activity dependent synapse remodeling. Okay, so I'm going to try to prove this to you. But before I do this, I just want to um, motivate a little bit. I wish I could say this is autism, but let me just motivate this a little bit. So when we first made this discovery and we found these MHC class one molecules in the brain, I went to PubMed, so this was now about 10 years ago, and I went to PubMed, and I always go to PubMed, and I typed in um, MHC class one and autism, nothing. MHC class one and schizophrenia. Well, when I first looked about 10 years ago, actually there, was, there were a few papers that suggested uh, doing, um, these were very small studies of families, actually, uh, suggested that in some of these small studies, there might be variants of MHC class one uh, uh, genes associated with schizophrenia. And I was so excited. And then about three months later, I would go and do the same thing, MHC class one and schizophrenia. And there'd be another paper, and it would say, no, we don't agree with the first paper. And really, literally, this went on for years until three studies were published back to back uh, in 2009, in the summer of 2009, um, in uh, Nature. And they were all very large uh, GWAS studies. Um, and actually, sometimes I call them GWIS studies. I hope I don't uh, offend anybody. But I mean, we still don't really know exactly what this means. But it was very exciting because all three studies agreed that there was at least one very highly correlated single nu nucleotide polymorphism right in the middle of the MHC class one region, and also a number of others that were associated. So there's kind of a cluster. Um, of MHC class one SNPs, 
uh, in all three studies, which were now larger. And I believe now there is another uh, study that's, that's, uh, that's being assembled, which is even bigger, in which these have become uh, even more significant. So we don't know what it means. We don't even know if these are encoding regions or, you know, like what the heck's going on. But it's just something tantalizing. Now, when we read these studies, I read these studies, I was really excited. So, of course, the first thing I thought, oh, good, they're going to refer to our papers, which had already been published. Nothing. So what happened is they all said, oh, yeah, well, there's this known relationship, epidemiological relationship between you know, schizophrenia and uh, seasonal uh, you know, flu outbreaks you know, years earlier in utero, sort of some correlation. And I forget, is it the second trimester, actually, maybe? And, and, and so there must be some relationship between inflammation and uh, later schizophrenia. OK, cool. But how? What would be the basis for the immune system changing your brain, OK? So what I'd like to suggest is, who knows? But I wanna, what I want to talk about are, th are ways that you could think and maybe even test how the immune system could actually directly talk to the nervous system by the very same molecules it's, that are used normally for the immune system to talk to other cells because we think MHC class 1 proteins are at synapses. So that's the bottom line. It's a large gene family, and there are many, uh, and they're highly polymorphic. And same thing in human, same thing in mouse. And actually, in mouse, just as in human, not that many are studied uh, extensively. Um, the classical MHC class 1 molecules have been extensively studied by immunologists because these are the ones that are known to present peptide to T cell receptor. But there are many, many other MHC class 1 molecules that are much less well studied, some not studied at all, in fact. So the first thing we did when we made this discovery is we thought, OK, well, let's just see where some of these are expressed in the brain. So this has been a big challenge for us. So we have to make um, uh, in situ probes that are specific for different family members. They're very highly related to each other. So, and we're kind of incompetent. So actually, we've made probes to some of them. For example, here's one, D, on a black six background. And this uh, is actually, it's a classical MHC class one molecule. And it's expressed in the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. This is mRNA. Uh, another non-classical MHC is expressed in the uh, granule cells of the cerebellum. And you can go all around the brain, and actually, incidentally, these are in adult right now, and you can look for where these MHC class one molecules are expressed. So uh, they're expressed in the cortex, different layers. This happens to be somatosensory cortex. D is expressed there. They're in the hippocampus. Uh, you know, they're in the substantia nigra. They're in the thalamus. And there, many are very dynamically regulated during development. So it's really it's complicated, basically. So remember, not only are these uh, mRNAs expressed, but this is how we found MHC class 1. We found it because it was regulated by activity in the visual system, block activity. OK, so we kind of have a smoking gun here. This is interesting. Is MHC class 1 needed for activity-dependent synapse remodeling? So actually, you know, my mom was always very interested in these things. She's not with us anymore, but I still think about her. So I said to her, Mom, how would you prove that MHC class 1 is needed? And she said, well, knock it out. And I said, that's really good, Mom, but which ones, right? Which ones should we knock out? So we've actually done a huge amount of work over the last uh, five years or so. And I'm going to make a long story short by saying that you know, looking at patterns of expression, we realize that both K and D are present in the LGN during the time, both mRNA and protein, I'll show you that later, are present in the LGN during the time that this activity-dependent synapse remodeling is going on. Moreover, it but, and we don't know which one, so it turns out that a colleague at Harvard at the time, Hidipleu, had made a, a mouse doubly mutant for both K and D. So this was actually good news. So we called up Hidipleu and we said, can we have your mouse? And he said, sure, you can have your, our, our, you know, our mice, but you know, they're going to be boring because they have brains. And they're, you know, they're fine. They're immune compromised because they don't have K or D, but they're perfectly fine and they have brains. And we were really excited because actually we had something to study. So you know, like if normally, in if you're a developmental biologist, if, if things have brains, then you feel like your gene isn't important. OK, but now I want to make a real point here. If you were a neuropathologist and you cut up the brains of these mice, the KD knockout mice, you would say they're perfectly normal. So 
But what I'm going to tell you is the detailed pattern of connections is not normal at all in these knockout mice. And in fact, when we blocked activity to do our original experiments, most aspects of brain development occurred normally. Cell migration occurred normally. The brains, again, from a neuropathologist's point of view, if you just slice them up, looked normal. But the patterns of connections, the layers, did not form in the LGM. So this is, we were happy. We thought, OK, we have a chance here. So what should we study in these mice? So we thought, OK, how did we find MHC class 1 in the first place? Well, what we, know, we found is that in normal activity present brains, gene expression was high. When we block activity, gene expression went down. When we block activity, the eye-specific layers don't form. So it occurred to us that maybe mice lacking K and D would fail to have this nice remodeling and would not have the adult pattern of connectivity. So actually, that's straightforward to study. So you can inject one eye in a mouse with a green tracer and another eye in the mouse with a red tracer. And when you do this experiment in adult mice, you know you get a nice green layer sandwiched by red layers if you look on the side um, ipsilateral to the green injection. So here it is. So this is the adult pattern of connections. It's very nicely sorted out. And in fact, here, the yellow dots are pixel overlap. So it just shows you there's just a little bit of overlap left. And this is in a mouse that's actually uh, it's uh, about a month old, I guess maybe three weeks old. So this, no, four weeks old. So this is well after the, the period when the eye specific layer should form. We did the same experiment in a knockout mouse. And what we saw was the, actually the retention of the immature pattern of connectivity, lots of pixel overlap. Actually, if we measured it, it was about the same percent as uh, initial. So, you know, I, I should point out here, right, that. There are certain features of LGN organization that are intact, but there are others that fail to develop. So the eye specific layers don't form, but it's not like the, LG, the retinal axons you know, grow out of the LGN and go all over the brain. They still know where to go, and that's because there are a lot of positional cues that are left that are not activity dependent, famous F EPH receptors and efferents for one. So I can talk about that more later. So we were very excited because the results of this experiment suggest that K and D are needed for this process of synapse remodeling during development. And in fact, for the process of synapse elimination. So in order to form the adult pattern of connectivity. And I don't have time to talk about a lot of the physiology we've been doing, but that could be a story for another day. OK, so this, I don't know if this would remind you of anything, but I'm just going to tell you that this phenotype is identical to a phenotype that is present in mice lacking C1Q or C3 or other aspects of a complement uh, cascade. So Beth Stevens and Ben Barris discovered in completely separate experiments where they happened to discover that ganglion cells uh, express C1Q, also not supposed to be in neurons, that when they looked at the C1Q knockout, the exact same thing happened. Here's the pixel overlap. So somehow there might be a C1Q MHC collaboration. I just want to remind you that these are really related to you know, the inflammasome and to a uh, process, again, of regression and elimination. OK. So I, uh, that's true. And then there was also, I was sort of reading some of these papers on schizophrenia. So I did C1Q and schizophrenia stuff comes up, too. OK, so how does MHC1 work? So I want to talk about this now, actually, for the rest of the talk. So the first thing is, where is the protein? Now, this has been a challenge. So um, there, because we need to have good antibodies. We need to have antibodies that are specific for this different MHC class 1 molecules we want to study. For example, K and D would be nice to have good antibodies for. So here's where, now I'm just going to whine for a minute or two. The, um, the immunologists have zillions of good antibodies. They're all used for cell sorting. So they all recognize the native protein. They work like in uh, fixed tissue. They don't work well in EM. And so it has been a struggle. However, uh, with that proviso, and um, also with the fact that we are in the process of generating much better antibodies now, let me just tell you some things. So first of all, if we use a pan-specific antibody, which in fact we know from Western blots uh, 
recognizes both K and D and probably at least one other MHC class one, but that's pretty good. At least it doesn't recognize a gazillion of them. Um, if you take hippocampal neurons and you put them in culture and you stain with an antibody uh, which recognizes it's more, it's more broad than one, then what we see is the hippocampal neurons, their cell bodies and their dendrites are beautifully stained in red. And actually you see at higher mag punctate staining and when we immunostain, co-immunostain with a marker for postsynaptic density, we see that there's a lot of co-localization, probably at spines. So MHC class 1 seems to be expressed in, these are you know, neurons and culture now, uh, both in the cell body and the dendrites and probably in spines, maybe at synapses. But we wanted to really look in vivo at real tissue sections, not at neurons dissociated, ripped apart and put in culture and asked to reform connections. So we looked in the LGN where we know that the mRNA is expressed for K and D and we have these really cool phenotypes. And when we first looked, we just cut sections of LGN and we did conventional immunostaining and conventional imaging. And what we saw was kind of um, a punctate blur, uh, very unsatisfying. So at that time, Stephen Smith, we'd moved to Stanford, and Stephen Smith had just invented a new method of localizing at much higher resolution, still not the EM, but much higher resolution, um, proteins at synapses. And it's called array tomography. And I'm just going to make a long story short by saying it's really a way cool method whereby you can use a, a, a sequence of different favorite antibodies, up to 10, and image them and look at their co-localization by essentially treating the tissue as if you're going to do EM. It's not quite EM. Cut very thin sections. This is a very thin section. In fact, it's a, a 70 nanometer th section. You can cut ribbons. You can stain with your first favorite antibody, in this case, the MHC1 antibody, uh, which is in green this time. Then you can image. You can make that image green. Then you can strip, strip the antibody. Then you can stain with your next favorite one, PSD95. You can image, strip, register, and align. And you can do it in depth because you have these ribbons. So you can actually, that's the tomography part. And the array part is you can array up to 10 different antibodies sequentially until you know the tissue falls apart, basically. But the point I want to make is that even in this thin section here that you're looking at, all the staining is punctate. And then you image using a confocal microscope. And so what looked like a little blur of stuff really becomes similar to what we saw in the culture. It's mostly these puncta. And those of you in the front probably can see that some of the puncta co-localize with each other. And when we do this actually for several different markers, both a postsynaptic marker and a presynaptic marker, which I think is, I'm not sure, I can't remember if we use synaptophysin or synapsin, anyhow, it doesn't matter. The point is, that at this level of resolution, what we see is that MHC1 puncta are co-localized with PSD95. They can be co-localized with synapsin. They, it can be co-localized with all three, suggesting at this level of resolution that MHC class 1 protein is at synapses in the LGN during this time of development and could be pre, could be post, could be both. Now, for perverse reasons, we like to think it's more likely to be pre than post. But uh, I'm sorry, post than pre. For perverse reasons, I'll come back to in a minute. But in fact, um, oh, let me just make one more point, which is that we can also look at co-localization of other markers. And what we also see is that MHC1 is highly co-localized with C1Q. I'm happy to explain this graph later, but the point is the bigger the number here, the more co-localized the proteins are. So this is wonderful and unexpected and puzzling that mice that have knockouts have the same phenotype and the protein at this level of resolution, they're co-localized with each other. And C1Q is also localized at synapses, whatever that means. Okay. And then Kim McAllister's lab published a very nice paper last year in PNAS in which they tried to do EM localization using the same antibody, which I really think is a crap antibody and is very sensitive to fixation. So this was very hard to do. And they, they saw gold particles located both postsynaptically and presynaptically. And I'm not sure, I think the jury's out, but I think everyone now agrees the stuff is at the synapse. 
exactly if it's pre or post or both, it's not quite clear yet. So this, I think, is very exciting, actually. So we can ask again, then, how does MHC class 1 work? So we thought about this, and we realized that, well, in other cells in your body, the way MHC class 1 works is it's, it's, it's present on the cell surface, and it presents peptide to famous receptors, including the T cell receptor. But there are many other immune receptors and many other immune cells be besides you know, CD8, CD4 T cells that are programmed to recognize MHC class 1 protein. And there are many other receptors. And these are members of the innate immune receptor family. This is a phylogenetically older family. And it occurred to us, we looked for the T cell receptor, incidentally. But when Josh Sykin and Tadzia Grandpre came to the lab, it occurred to us maybe we should just do an in situ hybridization screen that we should you know, make um, in situ probes for as many of these as we could, cut tissue of the brain. And you know, even though they're not supposed to be in the brain either, what the heck, we would look for them. And then if, we, if there was really interesting patterns of hybridization, we would get antibodies and look for the protein. And if we could get some good antibodies, we would follow up. And so today I want to talk about one particular receptor in the mouse called paired immunoglobulin-like receptor B. This is a member of the LILRB family in humans. There's a, it's a bigger family in humans. And this is a receptor that is a member of the Ig superfamily. It's very, it was already attractive to us because it's a transmembrane receptor with uh, has these famous ITIM motifs that when phosphorylated in the immune system are known to recruit phosphatases <laughs> in the immune system, it's known that when these ship phosphatases are recruited, that they, this engages downstream signaling that actually breaks or opposes adhesion and MAP kinase cascades. And of course, these are the signaling cascades that are the favorites of neuroscientists because they are known to be required for synaptic plasticity. So if you knock out or you block MAP kinase signaling, you actually block synaptic plasticity. So it's almost like this receptor is applying the brakes on synaptic plasticity, if only it were present in the nervous system. So to make a long story short, we got a good antibody, and we've made some other antibodies. And if you take cortical neurons and you put them in culture and you grow them in culture, again, you see this is the peer B. This is this protein. It's right at the palm of growth cones. These are neuronal growth cones. Here's synapsid and synaptic vesicles and the actin leading edge of growth cones in culture. <clears throat> in vivo, in mature brains, it's actually very highly expressed in hippocampus, in cortex, in cerebellum in the nose and so on. And in fact, it's sort of heartbreaking. The only place it's not expressed at all that we can detect is in the LGN. It may be in the retina, but we're, we're, we're not sure. We don't, we're at least not at high levels that we can detect. So we made a knockout. Josh Sykin and Tadzia actually made a knockout of this mouse. And we thought, OK, well, we can't look at, well, we did look, incidentally, at retinogeniculate um, connections, and the eye-specific layers are there, so they seem to develop normally. So we thought, well, let's look at our second favorite place in the brain, which is the primary visual cortex. I can also tell you about our third favorite part of the brain later, which is hippocampus. There, there are all kinds of interesting phenotypes in these mice, but let me just tell you about primary visual cortex. So we can look at synaptic plasticity in primary visual cortex. And we can look at a very classic form of synaptic plasticity, which is ocular dominance plasticity. So let me explain ocular dominance plasticity. So remember I told you that when the LGN axons go up to visual cortex, they're beautifully segregated from each other. They're interdigitated into right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye stripes. And you can see those stripes here, as shown in a beautiful experiment by Hubel Weasel and Simon LeVay. And in fact, you can. this is a monkey uh, visual cortex. And one eye was injected <coughs> with a white tracer. And that tracer went all the way up through the LGN up to the terminals 
uh, representing that eye in, in visual cortex. So you can see this interdigitation of the white eye, the black eye, the white eye, the black eye, and so on. And many years ago, Hubel and Weasel, trying to figure out was this a hardwired pattern, did their famous experiment of closing one eye in a monkey or cat during critical period of development, and lo and behold, discovered that the inputs from the open eye expand to take over way more than their fair share of cortical territory and visual cortex. And that's what you see here, where now the white is really expanded, and there are just these piddly black areas that belong to the closed eye. So this is actually one of the most graphic examples of use it or lose it of activity-dependent development that we have. <clears throat> and in fact, it's what kind of prompted me to try to understand the mechanisms underlying this process. So, um, so this is ocular dominance plasticity, and it happens in a critical period of development in the sense that once this pattern is formed and becomes stable, if you close an eye in an adult, normally, you don't get this kind of plasticity. So there really is very little change in the organization once formed. <clears throat> but during critical period, normal vision is required, and abnormal vision perturbs the outcome. Okay, so we can study this in the mouse. You can close an eye in a mouse, and you can get the same kind of result. The only sad thing is that to scale, the whole mouse visual cortex, in fact, both V1 and V2, fits in here. And incidentally, this, the width of a right eye plus a left eye stripe here is a millimeter, so the size of a grain of rice, right? So this is the whole mouse visual cortex. And, um, but you can still do the experiment in a mouse. And in fact, if you do that experiment, let me just show you. Here is uh, a pattern of input just looking at one eye, in this case, in a normally reared mouse. So that could be, you could imagine it as being the stripe. For aficionados in the audience, we didn't label the terminals. We actually asked the target postsynaptic neurons to report their activity using an immediate early gene. So in this experiment in wild-type mice, normally reared, we just closed one eye, we put them in the dark. Karen, I mean, you, I hope you guys know this because Karen's here. Anyhow, put them in the dark, take them out. They're looking only through one eye, and this ARC mRNA comes up. It's called ARC mRNA induction. We can do in situ, and we see it come up in this zone attached to the eye that's open. We can do the same experiment during the critical period in the mouse, where let's say we can take one eye out and ask, does the other eye expand to fill more territory? And as you can see, sure enough, that happens. <clears throat> so we did this experiment in the mutant mice, these pure B knockout mice, and lo and behold, we got a huge shock. What we had found is that there was extra expansion, actually throughout almost all of visual cortex, actually both V1 and V2 for the aficionados here. So rather than the knockout, if, if, if the gene is actually positively regulating plasticity, if you knock it out, there will be no plasticity. But in this case, we knocked it out, and there's more plasticity. So it fits with this idea of breaking plasticity. That's the, that's the concept. And it actually fits with what's known about signaling. <clears throat> but we just still didn't expect to see this. So we can measure this, and we can do everything blind to genotype. And this just summarizes that the knockout mice lacking PRB during the critical period have more plasticity than wild-type mice. OK. So we reasoned <clears throat> that if MHC class 1 ligands are binding peer B and signaling in such a way that if you knock out peer B, then the break comes off and you can get more plasticity. Then if we delete the ligands, namely K and D here, that's the hypothesis, then we also should get extra ocular dominance plasticity. And that's exactly what we found in a separate set of studies. So the results of these experiments then suggest that MHC <coughs> working through this peer molecule <clears throat> signaling may regulate plasticity, may actually break plasticity. So now you're probably wondering, is this good or bad for the mice? And we don't really know. And plus, we have really pitiful ways of assessing mice behavior, even more pitiful than you have, because you have more sophisticated ways here than we have <clears throat> at Stanford. But we can do a few things. So the first thing we did was we actually looked. This was a really nice uh, cover for the American scientists. I just thought it's perfect. So we can look at motor learning. In, in, so I'm going to now talk about the KD knockout mice, because we know more about them. Okay, So we can look at motor learning. Remember that 
that, that D is beautifully expressed in cerebellar Purkinje cells. Actually, K is co-expressed in cerebellar Purkinje cells. We have no idea why two of them are there. That's a huge another question. Maybe Kim knows. Anyhow, the point is that if you look at these mice, they're like Olympians. So the knockout mice learn much better than wild type. They learn the rotorot task. They get to a higher criterion. And then they actually remember it for much longer. I don't know if that's good or bad. So when we published the uh, experiments on enhanced ocular dominance plasticity in the KD knockout mice, the reviewers said, well, the mice probably can't even see. So actually, you know, they have to see because that's how we did the arc induction. But oh well. So we tested them. They're very nice techniques for uh, testing mice vision. They're kind of, you know, uh, coarse, but they work. So you can train a mouse in a hidden platform task. You can train a mouse to swim to the hidden platform associated with the higher frequency grading. Once it learns the task, which is going to take a while for this mouse, then you can gradually, de you can gradually increase the frequency on this side until their behavior falls to chance. And it's a nice way of actually testing their visual acuity. So it's possible to do it. So once they learn, they go right there, and then you, you can test them. That guy, uh, we're running out of time, but I assure you, eventually someone humanely takes him out of the. Uh... OK, so when we did this experiment uh, in normally reared mice, we found that the knockout mice can see at this level just as well as the wild type. But the interesting thing is, what happens to the remaining eye if you take one eye out during the critical period? And you have now engaged this extra plasticity. It could be bad, but it turns out that the knockout mice actually continue to be able to make the discrimination above chance at a time when the wild type are having a hard time. So this extra plasticity, it certainly is not deleterious. It may be beneficial. Who knows? So I mean, I think there are a lot more fun things to look at here. So what I've told you today is we think that MHC class 1, probably signaling through PRB, maybe other receptors, we actually saw a message for a number of these other innate immune receptors in the brain. And uh, other uh, labs have now been uh, showed, for instance, that uh, some of these KIR receptors and, and LI49 are present in neurons. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, I think. Signaling uh, somehow opposes the very cascades that are actually required for synaptic plasticity. This is very vague. You know, what do I mean by synaptic plasticity? Well, I've given you these readouts like ocular dominance plasticity, but we need to really learn much more about the, the cellular mechanisms that have been perturbed here, and we're working on that now. We really don't know a lot. So now, from perversity, we actually put the glutamate, we put the MHC class 1 protein on the postsynaptic side. And the reason we do it is that we see uh, much co-localization in the experiments that I showed you with postsynaptic markers. In cultured neurons, we don't see it in the growth cones and axons. We see it in the dendrites and cell bodies. So it could also be presynaptic. But for the purposes of our thinking, we've made a model which is sure to be wrong. We put it postsynaptic. And we put the receptor on the other side of the synapse. And we put it there because we see in cultured neurons, we don't see much expressed in the cell body. We see it at the synapse, and we see it in the growth cones in culture. And we see it in the developing nervous system in axon tracks. So there's not much protein. There is some. And when you see it in the cell bodies, it's in pyramidal cells. We rarely see it in dendrites. So this is just our imagination at the moment. But we feel there has to be a transsynaptic signaling system. Oh, yeah, and. <laughs> We don't know where C1Q is, but Ben Barris, they found it, pre, they found it in the ganglion cells. So you could put it presynaptic. It's in the LGN. It's in the retinal ganglion cell axons, if this is in the LGN. And somehow we think this may create a transsynaptic signaling system for deadhesion. So the idea would be when this system is engaged, that permits synapses to come apart and remodel. And in the absence of the system, the synapses are kind of stuck, and the remodeling doesn't happen. And so you, you get this failure um, of the adult pattern to emerge during development. Again, this is like tons amount of work has to be done. We have to know something about downstream signaling and the whole works. So what I've told you then today, basically, is that 
in addition to the sort of canonical uh, positive arm of a pathway that regulates synaptic plasticity that is the subject of study of many famous labs, including MAP kinase signaling and CREB and so on. You know, so if you knock out these guys or if you block their function, you, there's no plasticity. It's stuck. We think we found part of a signaling system that is involved in uh, opposing uh, or, or uh, plasticity, so a negative regulatory arm of the pathway. So there are sort of have to be like you know both brakes and accelerators in the system. Actually, that would give really fine control to this process of synapse elimination. So just think about this for a minute. During development, you know, in your brain, there's this wholesale remodeling that's going on. Some connections are being strengthened and stabilized by use. Others are being weakened and eliminated by use. And this thing is happening all over. And it's probably challenging for the system to maintain circuit stability in the face of this, these major changes that are happening in the circuit with use. And so if you only had accelerators in the system, there would be much more instability of circuits. There would be epilepsy, in fact. And in fact, in our knockout mice, some of them have much lower seizure thresholds. So we don't think they have epilepsy, or at least it's not, you know, grand mal obvious form. But we were actually quite interested in this issue of seizure, and we found uh, in work that we haven't followed up on, it's not published, but we found that uh, it's much easier to induce seizures in mice lacking actually the MHC class one proteins. We haven't looked at the pure B proteins. The other thing is that I think is interesting here is that really, truly, the nervous and immune systems share a common molecular language. I mean, if neurons have MHC class one protein at their synapses and it's regulated by activity and it's right there, then first of all, it can be, inter it can be interrogated by immune cells that are coming in or even innate immune cells that are right there, like the microglia, for instance, which you know I haven't talked about, but I don't want to give short sh shrift to them. Moreover, in inflammation, it's well known that inflammation regulates MHC class one levels. And not only in other parts of the body, but actually also in neurons. So there are many studies showing that if you take neurons and put them in culture and expose them to um, inflammatory cytokines, that you can alter the expression levels of MHC class one. So what would happen, do you think, if this happened at synapses during these critical periods of development when this massive process of circuit tuning is going on? Well, we don't know the answer. But I think all of these um, experiments that I've described today actually would provide um, some mechanistic ways of thinking and really of doing experiments to test some of these hypotheses. hypotheses. So with that, I just want to thank you all for your attention and for inviting me. And I just have had a wonderful day. I want to thank all my collaborators. And I think I've mentioned almost all of them. Uh, whose experiments I've discussed. Actually, Lisa Boulanger uh, uh, helped us uh, in the very beginning. She was a postdoc in the lab, and she now has her own lab at Princeton. And she's working very hard on these problems as well. And I want to just show you the current lab now uh, with members of the lab who are working on questions like trying to make conditional alleles so we can actually you know, create out things at the time we're interested in, and uh, trying to make better antibodies. Um, trying to do look at the downstream signaling pathways, and you know we need more hands. So if anybody's bored, they should come and visit our lab. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was wondering about um, if there's any evidence in this model about um, synapse specific, specific regulation versus global regulation. Like, do you think? the whole neuron is going to be changing, or individual synapses yeah. are going to be capable of making these regulatory decisions? Yeah, that would be critical to, to know, right? So the answer is we, we don't know. Um, so we view, first of all, it would be really nice to know even if different types of synapses have different MHC and you know whether it's regulated. One thing we do know <coughs> is we think the MHC class 1 transcripts are likely to be uh, 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 dendritically localized because there have now been several studies published where if you read the study and you go to their gene list, you know, and you look for what's regulated in their study, you find a number of these MHC class 1 
uh, transcripts are regulated. So it's, it's very interesting. So that would be perfect if they were part of a tagging system. And so the idea would be that each synapse would be marked with maybe even levels of protein, and that the levels would be some indication of the past history of activity at that synapse. There's no evidence for that, just a dream. Carl, very, very nice talk. And uh, I just wonder, like in, as you show in your diagram, in MHC, in immune system, you present a peptide, as you show that little red dot there. And then in the model that you show in the neuron system, I also see that red dot is there, so that I just wonder whether there's, I mean, there's evidence saying yeah. that there's still some peptide that they need to present on the surface in order to, to, to bind to the receptor and function. Okay, so let me, let me tell you, well, you know, like I put that red dot in there for completeness, right? <laughs> okay, seriously. So, uh, for most MHC molecules, probably all, to fold properly to get on the cell surface, they have to be folded in the ER. And to do that, the ones that have been studied well have to have peptide loaded into them in, in order to fold. So there are really t uh, two major sets of molecules that are required to get MHC to the surface. The first are the, uh, the transporters that transport the peptides into the ER called TAP. And then uh, after they're folded, to get to the surface and be stably expressed, this um, common light chain called beta-2 microglobulin, right? So when we first started our experiments, we actually looked at beta-2 MTAP. Karen is smiling because we were there at the same time at Berkeley. So we, we, we looked at double mutants beta-2 MTAP knockout mice. And many of these phenotypes are present in the beta-2 MTAP knockout mice, so that's good. But we don't really know, I mean, so, so I would really eat my hat if, if neuronal MHC is not loaded with peptide. I think the issue really is, so the T cell receptor system evolved to recognize the diversity of peptide presented. And recombination permits that diversity to happen. The receptors we're finding in neurons are not like the T cell receptor. They don't undergo recombination to make that kind of diversity. They're innate immune receptors, some of which actually have a very large, they can be very large families. They can actually be alternatively spliced and so on. But none of them are thought to really need uh, to use the peptide diversity. So they're recognize, recognizing other aspects, almost like really as if they were uh, signaling adhesion and deadhesion in, in a very uh, traditional classical way, the way other adhesion molecules and receptors work in the brain. So we're sort of more thinking along those lines. Still, the notion of which peptides, because peptides are getting loaded through degradation by the proteasome. So those peptides are also a record of the past history of protein synthesis, you know, at the synapse probably, right? You mentioned that some data on the hippocampus, have you seen similar changes then in MHC levels or, um, or plasticity? Yeah, so, so I'll just say a few things. I mean, a few things have been published. Um, most of the things that we've published have been in the beta to MTAP knockout mice. So Lisa Belanger, when she was a postdoc in the lab, showed that um, there's enhanced LTP and no LTD in the hippocampus. And that actually is amazing. That fits rather nicely with failure to eliminate synapse and with more plasticity and with this notion of break. And at the time that we made that discovery, really, we didn't, we didn't know about the peer receptor, but it, mod it actually motivated us to look for receptors that might actually modulate MAP kinase signaling. Right? So, so I think there's you know, a lot more to be done there. I was curious about the fact that you said these are spontaneous activity both at the retinal level as well as LGN. Uh, but what will happen if you have um, sensory input early on at the time that these systems should not be exposed to the... Well, the system is very careful to prevent against that. So yeah. sensory input doesn't alter these early patterns of activity because there's no photoreceptors, so mm -hmm. vision can't actually get in and change those patterns. But more, maybe, of more concern is that mm -hmm. it's conceivable that uh, drugs of abuse that alter neural activity levels could alter these patterns. And, you know, so the spent spontaneous activity throughout <coughs> the nervous mm -hmm. system during early fetal development. And these waves now we were first found in the retina, but mm -hmm. 
now people have found these waves all over the place. They found mm -hmm. them actually in the auditory system. They're all spontaneous. Before, um, before the ear, whatever, the, opens and before mm -hmm. the hair cells are mature, so there's no hearing, still there's a, the system is, is uh, sending activity in the form of waves to the brain. And uh, in the spinal cord now, it's known that the, you know, the kicking in the, of the baby, it's not just a random thing. These are uh, generated by waves of activity that are, that are being played in early motor circuits. And so all of these waves, you know, we know everybody actually now, we know a lot about the pharmacology of these waves. The early waves actually require cholinergic synaptic transmission and then later glutamatergic synaptic transmission. And you could imagine that um, drugs of abuse that would interfere with the patterns of these waves could have either a transient or a lasting effect on um, circuit tuning, which you wouldn't see as a neuropathologist. I don't mean to you know, bash the neuropathologist, but I just mean that without finer techniques for looking at the patterns of synapses, you, you wouldn't see it. So, and, and I have one, <coughs> one um, clinical uh, interest here. Uh, we, we have premature babies, you know, when they are born. A lot of premature babies now are kept even as early as 23 weeks gestation. So uh, I was uh, uh, wondering from your point of view, from visual development, how much we have to be careful about the visual input in the intensive care nurseries in general? Well, you know, so once the visual system, so I mean, I think one doesn't really know the answer. And actually, ne many neonatologists ask this question. Um, once the, uh, the, the photoreceptors are mature and vision takes over, then um, uh, you know the fetus actually can see in utero. Actually, I mean, in you can shine light, and you, you and the fetus clearly can see. So I think the issue is really whether the sound. I mean, I think you, one would worry about whether light levels and sound levels are way out of uh, whack because then it really is sensory experience. And the preemies that would be born that early. I mean, I don't know if if they can make it at the end of the first trimester. Can they make it at the end of the first trimester? But you would worry, then you would worry about the drugs you're giving them, right? That might interfere with activity in the brain. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.